I think it was two days after Christmas, everyone got the text to uh, evacuate. We knew at some stage that fire was going to impact us. It grew and grew and grew. It did a big run just before Christmas. It ran straight down the side of us and we then had to do a quite a, a mass evacuation of animals. New Year's Eve, we got the call basically to leave our houses to evacuate down to the wharf, which is where we stayed for pretty much uh, the next 24 hours or longer and witnessed an apocalypse. There was five different areas where you could see a big ball of smoke coming from. At night, you could see where it's all red. The sun came up at probably about six o'clock and then by 7.30, the whole sky just went pitch black. It was like the darkest winter night you've ever seen. And it remained that way for up until at least sort of 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And then everything just went red. We couldn't sort of look up because it was like stinging our eyes from this, I don't know what it was. It was almost like a little storm cloud. I remember looking at my little fella's white shirt and it was brown and our cars got covered in soot and embers and stuff. Standing there on a wharf watching a fire front come towards you, it, it's just constant choking smoke. Your eyes are absolutely irritated by the smoke. The families with children, it had a big impact on them because they had to be evacuated. Some people didn't want to leave their houses. It came within about 150 to 200 metres of where we were sheltering on the wharf. That was probably the most frightening thing because our only option, if it crossed Cools Inlet, was actually to get into the lake. Looking sort of towards Ruth and we could see like the clouds were, and the smoke was starting to sort of get thick. One stage when the ember attack was really bad, I mean, literally everybody was underneath the woolen blanket. We moved the animals from here to Raymond Island, to um, also to Bansdale, to Meetung, Hillside. We had a number of um, volunteers and carers that were helping out. It was a mammoth task and an absolute amazing team effort by, by people. I can't thank them enough. I told my dog Ollie that basically he had to keep his mask on. He wasn't happy about it. But in the end, he, I think, realised that it was actually easier to breathe. There were two bad times for my place and it was all burnt and that fire went across Yaomi, across Goonga, across the Rich Forest, the Quark Forest, Puggery and into Club Terrace. The whole lot burnt. Sarsfield, a lot of people lost their houses and I think Bucken, the farmers, Malakuta, it was devastation in Malakuta. When I came up the road in the car and saw my house, or what was left of it, I just started sobbing. And it was just unbelievable that, that it was pretty much demolished. The CFA rang me at about 7 o'clock in the morning on the 1st of January and that I needed to get up here. It took us about three hours to get here with trees falling and active fire everywhere. The scene was quite haunting. I spent a lot of time crying that day. However, once when we got here, the tears went from, you know, devastation to, oh my gosh, this place is, is green and lush and not even burnt, not even singed. Incredible amount of emotion, you know, that goes on. on the beach two days after the fire. We walked only half a kilometre along the beach. There were dead birds everywhere and heaps of blackened leaves that had come from the forest during the fire spread all along the beach up to a metre and a half high, a lot of it. And all these bodies that had been three or four tides in and out since the fire, so they were a bit bedraggled, but I could recognise most of them. And, and there would have been kookaburras, yellow-tailed cockatoos, lots of New Holland honey eaters, crimson rosellas, rainbow lorikeets, and little wattlebirds. How they come to be there was 
they were overcome by heat and smoke and thought they were escaping it, they would have just suffocated, dropped from the sky. I've been in East Gippsland for 20 years, and so in that time I've lived in a small locality called Goongra. I've been working in the forests around East Gippsland on threatened species and wildlife management. I also run a wildlife shelter with my partner. We get a lot of wallabies and wombats. Usually with fire, in the old days, <laughs> The fire used to burn and then it would get to the rainforest and then it would go over the top. That's what used to happen, they're very wet, um, so fire would stop. But now the climate's changed and it's drier and those areas are burning. Quark is very special ecologically. Quark sits at an altitude and latitude that provides this type of rainforest in its gullies that is a crossover between warm and cool temperate rainforest. Now, you can get those crossovers in parts of New South Wales, but you can't get that anywhere else in Victoria. You only get them in East Gippsland and Quark was a big stronghold for a lot of rainforest that had this special amount of species because the biodiversity, of course, increases twofold because you've got your warm and your cool temperate species in the same place. Basically, what is left in the areas that are left are in areas that have been evolving as rainforest since Gondwanic times, so before Australia had separated. I've heard that the quark rainforest, most of it got burnt, so those species won't exist and grow there again, most likely. It would be all great if they did, but it's a real struggle for rainforest in these times if they've burnt. I've worked for four decades in Tasmania, mostly as an environmental photographer, and I came here and was incredibly impressed by the Victorian forests because I'd always had rather a dour view of them in comparison to the fantastic Tasmanian forests, but they're different forests and they've got their own strength. What grieves me here, what worries me here, what really scares me from here is that this is what's happening globally. Like, this is now a systemic problem. This forest has been burnt, and you know, much in New South, New South Wales has also been burnt. But the trend is warming, drying summers, more dry lightning strikes, more ignition from lightning. And this is the global phenomenon. You know, we're in the age of, the, of fire. It's burned here and the damage to these trees and down there further we dive down into what was a rainforest gully. Con concentrated areas where you've got sassafras, black olive berry and other fire intolerant species, they're wiped out. So we've now lost the rainforest there. We'll, we've lost the rainforest component from up here. And that's the trend and climate change is the issue because it's, it underpins every environmental issue that we're now on and it's insanity that we're not pulling out all stops to address climate change. Um, and Australia is doing essentially nothing and should be a world leader in this. I moved here in, in August of 2019. Built the sanctuary uh, for koalas and kangaroos, primarily. We knew at some stage that fire was gonna impact us. It grew and grew and grew. There was quite a lot of survivors out here, but they would have starved to death if we weren't able to feed and so we had actively 15 feed stations out there and we were putting out 200 kilo easily a day of um, different types of food, apples, pears, carrots, uh, sweet potato, chaff, hay and water. So we were feeding out on the grounds and it was just amazing to see that life coming back. My family have been involved in the beekeeping industry for over 100 years. A lot of that time I've spent in these forests around here and we obviously depend on the, the public land estate forests for our bees to forage on. Very, very important 
And, and it's daunting after a fire how, how silent it is. It's just eerie. There's no life. For someone who's lived through a, a number of fires and to see the devastation, I guess, as you get older, somehow it, it takes a bigger impression. But to see the dead wildlife, the whole perspective, I lost a mate. So, yeah, it, um, I guess it weighs a bit heavy. From a management perspective, our industry and people like me have been so against this clear felling and changing the forest structure and what that's doing to fire behaviour. There'll be 40 plus years before it'll recover to any value of our industry or any of the neck defeating insects at all. So a major, major impact from that sense, all caused by poor management prescriptions and timber harvesting the wrong way. This here behind us, what we see is the, the evidence of clear felling, and I use the term, we've turned our forest into kindling. So we've brought all these stems really close together, they ignite more readily and they carry fire at a higher intensity. These forests here were traditionally open space forests that you could gallop a horse through. Coupled with that, you've got a lot of this older dead wood left over from the logging operation that adds to the fuel. In a nutshell, we're suffering from climate change, so we're naturally drier, but these types of forests are making our forests burn at a higher intensity more readily. You know, um, and that's a major change I've seen in my lifetime, that how we've changed the structure of these forests to be less resilient around fire. Insofar as climate change is concerned, yeah, look, there's definitely something happening. If you look at the rainfall records, there's been a significant decline in rainfall over the last 40 years compared to the 100 years before that. If you look at the last three in a row, they've been excessively dry here. The current land management strategy isn't working. You know, plan burns, how those burns take place, the strategy isn't working across this landscape. And so we need to look at it a strategy, revise it, and come up with something that works with this landscape. Back in the days, we had elders here that done the fire, the cultural burns. They never got a chance because this was changed into a mission, and they had a reverend here. Then. The elders here and our ancestors weren't allowed to speak their language. They weren't allowed to teach their culture. So we lost a lot of our culture through that. So that's made it hard on the next generation. When you're on the perimeter of influence, uh, it's hard to care for country. You know, we've had a uh, 150 years of our people being taken away from the country, put under protection by governments, mission stations. It's a great term, caring for country, but what does it mean? And so this is a reintroduction to country, it's a reintroduction to managing country. We're talking about being involved in things. It also means being prepared to do the footsteps in line with training, competency, and working with others. It's a new program where the guys and the girls get to own the program themselves and, you know, going out, looking after country and, yeah, I guess sort of build on their, their own sort of skills and knowledge. This program was created to look at the biodiversity post bushfires. It's a unique opportunity for Gunai Kurnai people to get on country and be involved in documenting, recording and learning their totem animals, the plants, bushfire impacts and how that bush reacts to these types of events. It's the first time in, since European settlement that our people have been back on country to reconnect with their cultural landscape. It's a highly significant program. 
I guess just, you know, sort of with healing country, it's going in and, and you know, and monitoring what those sites that were affected um, and monitoring that over, you know, a period of time. It's awesome now that we're able to have that opportunity to go out and heal and look after country where we haven't been able to do that in the past. And I think with the crew going forward, there's opportunity for them to learn more about their, their country and the effects of, you know, the devastations of fires and floods and stuff like that. I think that's one aspect of Aboriginal communities' uh, foundation. It's always being optimistic about change and not to rush change, that it could be intergenerational. New ideas, new concepts, new ways of doing things. And, you know, coming up with terms of cultural burning or, you know, sort of cool burning regimes. Cultural burning has always been a, a practice for Aboriginal people, especially traditional custodians. And learning from our old elders in our community, doing that together with the young people, young Gunnokano people, it's actually healing our people as well as for healing country. I think we've made recommendations around the management of cultural heritage back in 2003 that are only now being thought about and may be implemented. So, you know, it's been a long process. It hasn't been just something that's happened out of this fire event. Uh, it's improving the way Indigenous voices incorporated into emergency management, into strategic fire management and land management. So we're, we're you know, slowly influencing that sort of thinking. This is the Baton Rouge Wildlife Shelter. We're in uh, Bruthen, um, East Gippsland. We've all been caring for about 10 years. It got very, very quiet in this whole air region post fires with wildlife. I think we're all expecting to have a lot come into care and it just went deadly quiet, which is indicative of, you know, it being such an intense fire that we lost quite a lot of species. During that period of time, at the beginning of the year with the fires, we had been calling to get a basic quote for solar and very soon after that a huge team came out and they donated all these solar panels and an inverter and they loaned us Tesla battery until we could get our own sorted. It's allowed us to do everything we're doing now. Our engineer in Gippsland actually designed a portable modular solar system uh, that doesn't actually fix into the ground, it just sits on concrete bollards. Uh, and we were able to transport a portable renewable energy power system into the Baton Rouge Wildlife Shelter months before they could get electricity into that site. We're completely off grid here. We've set up the wildlife clinic, it's got electricity, we've got an aircon now, so that if we do have a heat event, we've got an area that we can put the animals um, and try to keep them relatively cool. We've got an incubator that needs to be run on power 24 seven, so with that, we don't have to worry. It um, makes it less stressful on the animals. Yeah, it's made an absolute huge difference for us and for us being able to care for um, the various different wildlife. My favourite part of this whole rebuild is that renewable energy has been at the centre of this recovery. It, it, from transporting a renewable energy power station into a wildlife shelter, we did the same thing up in Goongarra for a, um, a wombat orphanage and we donated a system to them. It, it's absolutely remarkable what we're seeing, the renewable energy uh, uptake uh, through Gippsland and particularly East Gippsland. It's really encouraging to see renewable energy at the epicentre of this uh, rebuild. And now that flows through to the recovery, the houses being rebuilt off the grid or with solar and battery storage, self-sufficient homes. The whole thing is, you know, once we get past the tragedy of this bushfire, we need to think about how to rebuild better than what we were beforehand. We could actually be putting in microgrid systems for less than what they would pay for grid electricity. It's safer for the environment from a bushfire perspective. It's cheaper for the consumer. It's great for the environment. It's great for jobs. So let's take this opportunity to rebuild our economy and our, our region better than what it was before the fires came through. Anything we can do as a society to move towards uh, renewables has to be has to be a positive. It doesn't matter 
Which way you look at it, it has to be a positive. Therefore, we should fast track it as much as we possibly can. Our solar was all upgraded. Um, after fires, it was, it was damaged. We we're very lucky, we, the insurance company have covered all that. And East Gippsland Solar replaced all the panels, all the batteries, all the inverters. It's all been upgraded. The amount of power we can generate is, is incredible. I can run a whole household here. I run everything as if I was on grid. It's the way of the future. We need to be going with solar, you know, sun, wind. We're, we've got that much here in Australia. We really need to be utilising the sun. Coal-fired power is, is the thing of the old days, you know. We shouldn't be doing that now. COVID's probably given people an opportunity to slow down a little bit, have a think about things, but certainly I hope that people have learned to be a little bit more patient in life, a little bit more acceptance of, you know, how fragile life is. And in that, think about nature, think about, you know, let's look after nature because we need it to live. Out in the bush, about five k's out, there was a uh, Rufus Whistler doing a bit of pruning and everything. In came another one, and, and they actually made it. <laughs> so there is nesting and breeding happening out in the bush, but you don't hear much sort of, there's, there's no dawn chorus happening. It'll be a while before that happens. Can't come soon enough for everybody. There'll be seed in the ground. There will be seed and there will be rainforest species and they will come back and come and start to grow. But whether they can grow into a rainforest that takes two to 400 years to grow before they get burnt out again is another story. And we'll see. I think it's up to us that, to decide whether that's gonna happen or not. These are uh, basics that Indigenous people, if they've been living on their country and observing, have knowledge to. It's a knowledge base that just generally doesn't get plugged into when it comes to emergencies. You know, and it's, it's, it's a basic respect of knowledge. Science can only tell you so much. You've got to go to cultural knowledge. It's also putting the culture in with science to tell the story and to help us manage things. And if Indigenous voices aren't in the knowledge world, you're missing your core ingredient to understanding. I'd like the government to put more effort into addressing climate change, because I think that's behind all these things like tornadoes and fires and, and floods. They're more severe than they used to be. It's happening right around the world. So it's really time that more was done to counteract it. I have seen the consequences of the bushfires that destroyed half of Mallacoota and our wildlife and all of the things that we know and love there. That to me sends a very strong message about needing to act now, not waiting, but setting very strong emissions reduction targets that keep us under 1.5 degrees of warming. Hopefully these type of events are a catalyst to move faster in a sense of renewables and, and just making a, a more sustainable planet for future generations. And, and we're only custodians here for a very short time, and I think in my lifetime, and how quickly that is, is passing, we owe it to future generations to make it a better place. <laughs>